and welcome to Masterminds 2021, the Zoom edition. Uh, my name is John Anderson. I'm a past president of the University of Victoria Retirees Association. And to begin, and on behalf of Masterminds and the presenters this evening, I'd like to acknowledge the Laquentian speaking peoples on whose unceded territories the University of U University of Victoria stands and the uh, Uxanich, uh, Squimalt, uh, Songhees peoples with whom we share this wonderful spot on the earth. The, uh, the Mastermind series uh, is an initiative to uh, foster university community engagement by providing to the public high quality lectures at the University of Victoria. The series began in 2007, initiated by Beverly Timmons, who was a board member of the Retirees Association, and Elaine Gallagher, who was director of the Center for Aging, uh, which since has become the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health here at the University of Victoria. Over the past 14 years, over 60 thoughtful and often thought-provoking lectures have been presented. The Mastermind series compri is comprised of four lectures, one on each Wednesday evening in April. Each lecture is created and delivered by a distinguished UVic retiree, uh, and the presentations are certainly thoughtful and thought-provoking. And tonight's presentation will certainly add to our record of excellence. The uh, Mastermind series is, uh, is a collaboration between the UVic Retirees Association and the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health with assistance from uh, University Media Relations and Public Affairs Group. And one of the notable uh, contributors to the series is Leah Potter. She's behind uh, the camera, so to speak, this evening and, and sets up and organizes the Zoom formats uh, for us this year. We'll begin with Dr. Pur Perkis's uh, presentation in a few moments, but just a few notes on the Zoom format. Uh, as audience members, your audio is muted and only our presenters and I will be on the video. This event is being recorded and uh, the presentation will be made available uh, in YouTube format at the websites of either the Retirees Association or the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health. We're pleased this evening uh, to be able to uh, offer uh, closed captioning. It's provided by Ali Bosley uh, from the Island Deaf and Hard of Hearing Center. Uh, to uh, activate the closed captioning, you can just go down uh, to the bottom right of your screen and it says closed captions and if you click on that icon it says show subtitles you can click on that and subtitles will uh, appear if the size of the uh, subtitles isn't uh, appropriate the font size is too small you can go to subtitle settings click on that and you can get a little bar you can increase the size of the print in addition to the closed captioning, we'll also have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you wish to, uh, if you wish to uh, make some uh, questions, just enter them in the little Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Now, um, to begin. The presentation and to introduce this evening's mastermind we have Dr. Sally Kimson. Oh, good evening everyone. Um, I'm going to be introducing Mary Ellen. Um, Mary Ellen was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta and attended the University of Calgary graduating in 1981 with an undergraduate degree in nursing. Her first professional nursing position was a staff nurse in the emergency room at Holy Cross Hospital in Calgary. And that experience had the effect of securing her nursing identity for a lifetime. No matter what work or life experience she encountered in the intervening years, 
Her identity as an emergency room nurse always served her well and has framed her response to many a predicament she has faced both personally and professionally. Following two years of professional nursing work in the United Kingdom, Mary Ellen enrolled in a graduate program focused on nursing education at the University of Edinburgh. She made lifelong friends there and developed a strong attraction, attraction to both the university and the surrounding Scottish countryside. Following completion of that degree, she returned to Alberta and took up a teaching position at Medicine Hat College. And then with that teaching experience under her belt, she returned to the University of Edinburgh to explore the world of research through a doctoral degree program. She conducted a study of public health nursing based on ethnographic work completed in Alberta. In 1993, she was offered an assistant professorship here at the University of Victoria and has never ever regretted her move to the coast. As an aside, this is when I met Mary Ellen, who subsequently became my doctoral supervisor, cherished friend and colleague. Early in her time in Victoria, Mary Ellen had the opportunity to meet and spend time with home care nurses observing their practice and listening to their stories of working with people in their communities. The experiences described by the nurses tugged at Mary Ellen's long ago adventures in the emergency room. These nurses never really knew what they would find when they entered someone's home and often had to use ingenuity and invention to help the person work out solutions to their day-to-day -day health issues. The work of home care nurses had and still has today receive very little attention in the professional literature. Only recently during this COVID pandemic have we had small glimpses into the work, the working conditions, and perhaps most importantly, the remarkable impact on people's lives and health that these nurses have. After years of teaching, continuing her program of research, being inspired by her graduate students and serving many years in administrative roles as director of the School of Nursing and Dean of the Faculty of Human and Social Development, Mary Ellen retired in 2017 and has returned full circle to her identity as an emergency room nurse and wannabe home care nurse. She works part-time with a small group of community-based elderly religious women in Victoria, supporting them and assisting them with health concerns and in aiding their transitions from independent to supportive to residential care living arrangements. Her presentation tonight builds from her research and professional experience and benefits greatly from her valued professional and academic relationships. Thank you, Sally. Good evening, everyone. Now, the, uh, I still have a little, I have a little note on my screen that says, you've asked me to start my video. And I will just press that again. Okay, there we go. Maybe that's it. Can, I'm hoping you can all hear me. Good evening to you all. I am so pleased to finally have this opportunity. I signed up for this opportunity a year ago and then COVID hit. And so here we are a year later and uh, I've had many opportunities in the intervening months to think about this uh, idea of aging in place. And I'm really pleased to be here this evening to share some ideas with you, some information that I hope you will find helpful in your own um, uh, aging in place um, arrangements and, and uh, queries. So this is a topic that seems to become ever pressing as we age. Questions like, how will I manage to live a good life as I grow older? And as it becomes difficult to accomplish all the things that I value, and that makes my life meaningful. If you're asking questions of yourself like this, you're already thinking about aging in place. These questions may arise when you turn towards annual tasks like spring cleaning or yard maintenance or putting up Christmas lights. Tasks that used to bring you joy and pleasure may now be begin to cause you worry. Worry about whether you have the strength to do those tasks and perhaps also worry about what it might say about you if you're no longer able to do these things on your own. Aging in place demands our attention. I think it's worthwhile thinking about it at any age in order to be attuned to opportunities that may arise 
that you could use to build on and supplement over time and make it more likely that your future course will be in line with your own hopes and values. All right, let's get started. Now, come on, why is it not moving on? There we are. So why would we want to th be thinking about aging in place? Uh, there is a long and sometimes winding pathway from your own home. And now I see I have I have various pictures here on my screen, but hopefully you'll be able to see this, that this is a this is a little representation of a family home. And then this is the long and winding path that takes us to um, this picture, which is quite a um, familiar one now for us all of us who've been watching uh, seniors in long-term care facilities through the pandemic who have not been able to um, be in uh, personal contact with their own family and friends. They've had to be watching them through the, through the windows. And this has been a really disturbing um, experience for many, both those inside a long-term care facility as well as those on the outside. And I think it has severely, uh, uh, underlined the need for us all to be thinking about how do we want to move from our own home to a place perhaps into our future where long-term care might be the best place for us to obtain the kind of care and support that we need in our in our much older years. When I talk with people about this move from a house to long-term care I hear two general concerns. The first is the fear of being moved, perhaps not entirely at your own will, to a less desirable place from a more favoured living space, either by family or infirmity or even finances. And I also hear concerns about people trying to calculate when a good time to move would be. Moving and should they be thinking about just moving once, making that one big last move, or should they be thinking about making a series of moves and what kind of energy and financial resources might be called upon if you're going to make either one of those kinds of moves. So there's lots of things that people have to be thinking about. So now we're into this landscape uh, and it's a rather changing landscape of aging in place. There's four key things that I'd like to speak with you about this evening. And those are some of the ways in which the private and the public sphere um, impact aging in place. What kinds of housing models are there out there for us to be considering? And what sorts of living arrangements once you've selected a housing model or you're, you find yourself moving towards a housing model of a particular sort, what sorts of living arrangements can you be thinking about that you might encounter once you get there? And I think a little bit towards the end about the role of technology in all of this business of trying to age in place. I wanna begin with a bit of history of community-based supports that are designed to aid aging in place, because I think it's important to recognize that we don't just we don't just move from our family home often directly into long term care. For many of us, there there may be a very quite a long, lengthy period of time where you remain in your family home and you need to find um, supports to help you stay there and to help you stay there safely, and hopefully. Um, as, as happily and as with as much quality of life as you can. So I want to go over a little bit of history, uh, look at a little bit of what I'm calling the geography of, um, uh, of aging in place, and then a little bit on funding, uh, looking at some of the difference between public and private um, uh, arrangements for aging in place. So let's start with a bit on the demographics of aging in place. 26 years ago, in 1995, which seems like a long time ago and yet not very long at all, a couple of demographers from University of Montreal undertook a study looking out across Canada at the factors that were underlying admission to long-term care facilities. An interesting finding 
was at that time of that study in 1995, uh, across the whole country, taking the whole country into consideration, 8.2% of the total Canadian population resided in a care facility. And that would be a long-term care facility. I'm going to come back to that number a little later on when we look at the current picture here on Vancouver Island. Carrier and Peltier uh, acknowledged that there are differences in how access to long-term care is experienced across this very vast country with very different funding models within each province. Healthcare, as many of you understand, is funded through transfer arrangements from the federal government, but that's primarily and almost exclusively for hospital acute care based uh, care. That leaves the uh, provinces uh, with the responsibility of, of funding long-term care, residential care and so on. There is no direct funding from Ottawa for those kinds of care arrangements. And so in each province, they're quite different from one another. Having said that, they did find, they did make some sort of general uh, conclusions out of the um, demographic data that they looked at. And these were some interesting tidbits that I found that I thought I would share with you. For those who are over 85 years of age, there was a 7.3% greater chance of being admitted to long-term care than there was for those 65 to 70. So this simply says that as we age, it is more likely, it becomes more likely that we go to and find care and support in a long-term care facility. But also, and importantly, those with an annual income of, at the time, less than $10,000 a year, which is about $16,000 a year in 2021 dollars, were twice as likely to be admitted to long-term care than those with an annual income of $20,000 uh, and, and more, approximately $34,000 in 2021 dollars. So this is to, to say that uh, there is an inequity in who ends up in long-term care and often those with more resources can fund a wider variety of supports either in their own home or they can find other sources, other ways of having their care needs met that mean they don't necessarily uh, always end up in long-term care. Uh, right, so, and finally, uh, one of their findings was that seniors who are single uh, were twice as likely to be admitted to long-term care than those living with a spouse, a partner, or someone cohabiting with a family member. And this is something that we often find um, ourselves if we've grown up through a marriage or a long-term relationship. One partner often ends up caring for another partner in the family home, but then if that partner finally perhaps either goes to long-term care or passes on, that leaves the other person with no one to care for them. And then these single individuals will often find their way to long-term care. In terms of their conclusions, um, these are also, I think, quite significant. And I hope you can read this. Again, I'm just gonna note that I can't see all of it because um, uh, video boxes are, are sharing there, but I'll just read this to you. The growth of the elderly population and increases in numbers of seniors living alone and with life expectancy gains that may yield more years with infirmity of one sort or another will create strong pressures on the demand for institutional housing services. So this was when they completed their study in 1995 and looked at the age and trends of where people were ending up in their later years they were seeing already that the growth in elderly population was going to place strong pressure on the kinds of long-term care facilities that we've seen today and we've seen in many ways don't meet the needs of a contemporary senior population particularly in the conditions of a pandemic um, much of what we saw of the disaster that occurred in Ontario and Quebec early on in the pandemic and recurringly across the country at varying times 
has been about the fact that this is very old housing stock. It tends to be uh, housing stock where uh, seniors, perhaps four, are in a room with a shared uh, bathroom. This, these are not ideal circumstances for frail elders to be living in. And so, uh, again, there is this pressure that I think exists currently and will continue to press us as we think about uh, notions of aging in place. They also noted that the um, uh, the aging population is, or, or the population over the next, uh, in the future, they felt would be better educated, and that this would have, um, uh, they felt, um, uh, a circumstance that would mean tomorrow's elderly persons would be much more able to contribute to the cost of their own institutionalization, which I thought was a very interesting way of putting it. But here we are finding in 2021, a vast array of options and certainly if you are better educated and you've therefore had a, a position where you've um, been able to accrue finances, perhaps both partners have been working for a number of years, the finances are there, you can take advantage of those financial resources that you've got to fund your own form of institutionalization and for sure private companies are uh, there at the ready to make all kinds of um, options available for you at sometimes quite a considerable cost. And finally, um, I think that this is an important conclusion that they also came to. We, the, the authors of this study, do not contend that there will be a decrease in the need for institutional care based solely on the perspective in, of, of improvement in the economic well-being of the elderly person. Our results highlight the importance of the supply of care and services, by which they mean beds in long-term care facilities, on the likelihood of institutionalization. I'm going to come back to this idea again towards the end of the, the presentation, because I think that this, um, all of these messages that these authors were conveying 25 years ago, um, they do not seem to be, have been heeded terribly well. And we find ourselves in a set of circumstances now where um, there is great pressure on those long-term care um, resources. And in large part, because we have not um, developed them in line with the numbers of, of the aging population. Now I'd like to just move on a little bit to the uh, context in British Columbia. In the intervening quarter of a century, since uh, Carrier and Pelche wrote their, uh, their paper, we have seen a rapid increase, and along with that, much debate, on some major policy shifts that have affected seniors' abilities to age well in their communities. So now we're talking about that period of time when you've gone past a point where you can fully independently live your life as you have, uh, uh, through your life to that point, and now you're at a position where you're requiring a bit more support. Chief among these uh, changes and the rapid policy shifts have been the changing elig eligibility for home support and for personal care. I want to start with a report by the BC Ombudsperson uh, published in 2020, 2012, uh, and it was called The Best of Care, Getting It Right for Seniors in BC. In this report, it was noted that in the 1980s, uh, the goal of home support programs was to, quote, provide personal assistance with activities of daily living and or essential household tasks, which the client was unable to perform independently. This was a sort of definition of home support. Examples of what kinds of supports would were being offered at this time were cleaning, grocery shopping, cooking, uh, assistance with bathing and toileting, general hygiene, helping people go for walks, transferring from bed to chair, helping with uh, eating meals, providing skin care, delivering medications, shopping and home maintenance tasks such as, for instance, chopping wood, 
removing garbage, and shoveling snow could all be authorized in exceptional circumstances. So at that time, 1980, a wide range of services was being offered and delivered to seniors and others needing these kinds of supports in their home. By 1992, um, there was a, there, in response to budgets that were being pressed and uh, arguments that were being made that these kinds of programs were far too rich and we were not able to afford them any longer. There was an elimination of meal programs, elimination of any kind of transportation and elimination of housekeeping services. Now these are three elements of home support programs that are crucially important to, to seniors and and if they were present, they would keep a lot of people at, at home uh, healthy and safe uh, for a good long period of time. But without them, it has meant that either people have had to struggle to provide these things themselves, or they have to go into the private marketplace to obtain these. In 2002, there was a, 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 a redesign was undertaken to address now, having recognized, having made that change 10 years earlier, now it's recognized there was a need for a broader range of care options because people were so-called unnecessarily being institutionalized because they weren't getting the kinds of supports in community that they needed. And at this time, uh, the notion of an assisted living program was created. Uh, sorry, now I've just got a phone call here that I'm going to just delete. Um, in 2005, uh, three years later, the Premier at the time, uh, Gordon Campbell, uh, set up a council on ageing and seniors issues that again was interested in looking at new, broader and more widely available home support systems uh, to provide a wider range of home supports, uh, including cleaning and home maintenance to people who are unable to carry those tasks out on their own, which sounds remarkably like what was being offered in 1980. What is kind of interesting in all of this is through much of this time, 2002, 2005 for sure, we did have uh, a, a government, same government, uh, Gordon Campbell's Liberal government, which seemed to keep looking and setting up these kinds of councils and reviews and policy options, etc., to apparently um, address and deal with the situation that was arising, which was more and more seniors needing um, long-term care facilities because they weren't getting the kinds of supports they needed in community, but never really the kind of response that, um, as the BC Ombudsperson noted, had been set out uh, quite some time before, in 1980. In 2017, uh, Andrew Longhurst, who was writing a report for the Canadian Centre of Policy Alternatives, wrote his report and it was called, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to just pull this in, uh, Privatization and the Declining Access to BC's Seniors Care. Longhurst undertook an historical analysis of population growth, particularly in the seniors population, and looked at that in, in relation to the development of public, non-profit and private for-profit housing and programming options aimed at supporting BC seniors to age in place, with the specific interest for government in reducing demands for the public long-term care sector. Longhurst's conclusions illustrated the impact over 15 years from 2000 to 2015 of policy changes, noting that uh, uh, were aimed at improving they were supposed to be improving circumstances and access to a broader range of services for BC seniors. Recall too that Carrier and Pelche's conclusions that with growing prosperity, we might expect that seniors would be well positioned to fund their own institutionalization. All of this was feeding into these changing circumstances and an increasing, in Longhurst's view, an increasing level of privatization in this whole sector. He had three recommendations. The first was that the province should stop enabling the privatization of the home and community care system. 
expecting the private system to fill gaps left behind by with withdrawal of the public system from funding these supports has not improved access. Secondly, he argued that uh, the government should deliberately improve access to publicly funded home and community care programs and th that these should be provided by health authorities and nonprofit organizations. I just want to note in an aside here to think about what BC did do early in our pandemic experience. They funded at considerable cost and now an ongoing cost the one facility policy that ensured healthcare aides would be able to work at a level they needed to make a living wage and to do so in just one facility rather than moving between facilities, potentially spreading the COVID virus as they went about trying to make ends meet for their own lives. Government here also established wage parity among staff working in the public and private facilities. And this policy change will require ongoing funding. And so I believe when similar studies might be completed in the years ahead, these will go some way to improving BC's standings uh, on the funding of seniors care compared with other provinces. At the time that uh, Longhurst did this study, I believe we were eighth out of 10 provinces, so very low down. And we had started out uh, decades earlier being very high um, on, the, on the list in terms of what uh, supports we were providing. Finally, Longhurst uh, called on the province to develop an action plan that would improve access and service integration and establish minimum standards of care across all long-term care, assisted, assisted living and community-based programs. This is work that several groups are now trying to foster and Dr. Samir Sinha from the University of Toronto, you may have seen him uh, on television, I think he's leading a national coalition to try to establish long-term uh, standards for long-term care, which I think will be uh, very beneficial um, to guide the onward development in this whole area in the years ahead. I want to now just take a little bit of a side uh, way out to look at a few housing models and what I'm calling the geography of home and community care. So we're going to look for a moment here at the different locales of senior living. I want to just say that wherever you live for you that is home. However, when you start speaking to professionals working in the home and community care domain, there is a particular way of talking about housing models and what is possible to support your life in the home. First is independent living. So this in professional parlance, this means, uh, diff well, different kinds of things, but anyone living in their own private home, family home, you would be said to be living independently. There are also facilities, uh, residential uh, settings where uh, you are said to be uh, living independently, but you still get some supports uh, for uh, basic uh, laundry, uh, a bit of housekeeping support, etc. For anyone living in independent living, you can always access home support either th through public uh, sources. If you, you must first get yourself a case manager, that's kind of critical in this whole thing. If you have a case manager, then they can help, help provide you access to public services. If you want to go private, there are a number of private uh, providers. Um, again, the quality is can be quite different and it's always a good idea to try to check in with someone that you know and respect and uh, to just check and find out if they have used a, a service that they find particularly um, high quality. Home nursing care is uh, primarily a public resource and again through a case manager if you're having um, say if you've been in hospital for a, a procedure, a surgical event or something, you can return home and uh, uh, if needed, uh, you can be offered home nursing care where wounds can be monitored and various post-operative uh, initiatives can be undertaken. Typically, these are very short term now. It used to be that home care nurses used to visit uh, seniors in the in the community for many, many years and just drop in once in a while, check and see how everything's going, make sure the pills are being taken, make sure that uh, food's uh, good in the fridge, etc. 
and in this way kind of promote uh, an ongoing uh, level of quality uh, care in the home. But none of that is any longer funded. More recently, uh, some of you may have attended the End of Life Matters series that happened earlier this January, and you will have heard uh, from speakers there about the new and developing initiative that Island Health is running on palliative and end-of-life care, where home care nurses are beginning to develop relationships with people as they're getting towards the end of life and providing those palliative and end-of-life care services and supports in people's homes. So that's independent living. Assisted living tends to be a very particular arrangement here in BC. And again, through some of those policy shifts that have happened over the years, these, um, uh, this has changed a little bit uh, over time. Uh, originally in BC, when assisted living programs were introduced in the early 2000s, there were six prescribed services that fell under this title. First was regular assistance with, assist, uh, with activities of daily living, including eating, mobility, dressing, grooming, bathing, etc. Central storage of medication, distribution of medication, administering medication or monitoring the taking of medications, maintenance or management of cash resources, monitoring of food intake or of adherence to, excuse me, therapeutic diets, structured behavior management and interventions, and psychosocial rehabilitative therapy or intensive physical rehabilita uh, rehabilitative therapy. Facilities that were seeking formal recognition and therefore funding support from the provincial government for offering assisted uh, living services needed to provide two of these six, service, six services and the two most commonly offered were regular assistance with assistance of day or uh, activities of daily living and the central storage and management of medications. If people living in an assisted living facility required more services, then they had to leave the assisted living uh, facility because the providers were only uh, allowed, most of them only set up to provide the two services. So if, if people needed more than that, they then were left moving to long-term care because that was the only place that they could get what they needed. Many of them, in fact, did not need to go to long-term care. They were uh, still uh, quite able to function and had they only just had the service delivery, they could have continued to function well at home. This, press, this created a lot of pressure in the system for people needing to move to long-term care. And so more recently, uh, the Assisted Living Act has been changed that, such that operators can now offer as many of those six services as they wish. Uh, as a consumer, you need to be aware of which ones are being offered in any given site that you might be seeking access to and whether those will suit your particular needs. Now, seniors are eligible to remain a resident in assisted living, providing they can make decisions that will keep them safe in their daily lives and that they can respond appropriately in an emergency. They need to be able to act in such a way that does not endanger other residents and they do not require regular professional health services. Uh, so perhaps something like palliative end of life care. Um, some facilities uh, will allow a little bit of that, but really um, if, if a person is in need of ongoing nursing care um, or other treatments, uh, that is typically a signal that they should be moving to long-term care. The key uh, distinguisher for long-term care is that there, there is available 24-7 uh, formal nursing care and nursing care services. So that's really what designates a long-term care facility and makes it different from assisted living. There are many uh, private models uh, that offer um, an integrated series of, of um, um, uh, offerings. So you'll often see in the newspaper, uh, there's more and more of these all the time, new uh, private uh, for-profit often, uh, um, models of care, which they will call retirement living, age, it's an age in place 
residents and they talk about having care levels. So they will have things like independent living and then you can move to assisted living in the same facility. And then should you develop typically dementia is what they set themselves up for. There are a smaller number of um, more like private long-term care for people living with dementia, but you remain in the same place throughout. So I think when we thought back to the beginning of this presentation and those questions about, you know, should you be thinking about maybe moving from independent living into an assisted living uh, site for a period of a number of years, and then with the possibility that you might need long-term care at towards the end of your life, that would involve those uh, two additional moves here uh, we have these op these private models, which tend to be quite pricey by the time you get to um, memory care, which is the sort of top level care, you can be paying somewhere in the region of ten to $12,000 a month for that kind of uh, care and support. Within any of these kinds of living uh, uh, housing models, there can be a number of different living arrangements that are also emerging uh, that can be implemented in such a, such a place. Um, and I just want to review a few of these because I think I don't want to run us completely out of time here. Uh, two different uh, ways of thinking about this one is what they call built form housing. So these are specially designed, specially built places. Dementia villages uh, from the Netherlands, uh, there is one now in Langley, uh, which got a lot of press when it first came out. These are specially designed for uh, residents with dementia and they're set up to look much less institutional, much more like a little village scene. So there's libraries and coffee shops and grocery stores where residents can go in and, um, you know, uh, uh, appear to be buying things for themselves. It's all fostered and, and supported inside by staff members. Um, a lot of debate in some ways about it, uh, but also um, it's it certainly presented as a very humane alternative to institutionalized care. Abbey Field Houses was uh, something that arose initially in Britain. These were old, uh, typically big historical homes that were redesigned entirely on the inside to uh, develop, say, 10, 15 uh, individual units inside where people could um, live in the unit and then share a kitchen and other uh, common areas. Mixed use developments have been uh, have arisen primarily here in Canada, but I think are also being picked up elsewhere. Here you have seniors housing above a shop or perhaps a library. I'm thinking about the the housing down in James Bay, where the new library was was located, and there's a Red Barn Market around the corner, all in the lower level, and then uh, housing above. The Eden Alternative, uh, Eden Alternative and Greenhouse Project are very similar um, and actually very similar to the notion of an Abbey Field House. Here we have small numbers of seniors living in a very home-like environment. Everybody has their own room and space, but there is a common area and they tend to just be distinguished by the level at which the staff integrates in and uh, there's a much more collaborative uh, a set of arrangements of working so that uh, seniors are helping with meal preparation in some um, as they are able to, helping with the laundry, uh, helping with the gardening, etc. Co-housing is an idea that's come that started in Denmark and has been picked up here in Canada. There is a co-housing development out in Souk, which has been quite uh, widely um, noted and uh, now serves as a bit of a um, uh, core place where you can go to learn about that particular model. In that one, uh, everybody buys their own home. They commit to living in that community for a lengthy period of time. Typically, it's different age groups that are brought in there so that everybody can kind of go through the cycle of aging and receive support from younger people living in the community and offer uh, supports as they can to childcare, etc. Perhaps if they're if they're retired. 
similarly within any of these kinds of initiatives or even in more um, traditional forms of, of uh, community-based care or uh, community-based facilities, you can have things like uh, the village movement, which is really just people kind of getting together and uh, figuring out how to share services a little bit, maybe more like co-housing. Home share programs are starting to pick up. These are programs where a senior, perhaps with a, a big empty house, uh, will open it up to younger people. And for a minimal rent, uh, those young folks will help with gardening and help with meal preparation and so on and, and provide some supports for that senior. Multi-generational programs are offered in many different locations. Certainly here in Victoria, there's some multi-generational programming that goes on up at the Cridge. There's a uh, an associated um, daycare next door and the kids will often come and spend some time with the seniors at the Cridge facility. I just want to kind of mention, I'm not going to get into this in a great deal of detail because it's, it's kind of vast in and of itself, but certainly there is huge business, huge uh, money going into looking at technological supports that help people age in place. You've seen all the compute, all the uh, robots that uh, people can buy now, smart homes that uh, can be uh, various uh, elements of the home can be monitored from afar by children or others uh, concerned with a, an aging, perhaps uh, cognitively impaired adult. Um, people can be reminded to take their pills with a little voice that comes up. Um, there's many of these kinds of things. Um, uh, I'm sure that they will continue to evolve in the, in the years and decades ahead. We have, um, you know, a fall detection technology such as this one, you know, here's someone who's fallen over, their watch says to them, it looks like you've had a hard fall, do you need emergency or, you know, which one of these are you going to press? If you've fallen and you can read this <laughs> and you've got the wherewithal to push one of these very tiny little buttons, you can get some help. So these kinds of things can be quite helpful for people who are out and about in the community. I want to just take a few minutes here as we get to the end of the presentation to just undertake maybe a little bit of um, uh, analysis of all of this uh, raising, rising concern about aging in place. Um, I think that uh, as I was preparing for this session early on, I you know dipped into Google to see what I could find and just to get a sense of how this topic's being addressed outside of my own particular academic interests. I was interested to know how the world is a bit, how the world is a bit beyond healthcare uh, and how they're thinking about aging in place. And here are just a few headlines that I found. So, you know, people interested to know how will COVID change aging and retirement, um, living their best life, seniors focused startups and venture capitalists uh, reevaluating elder care. So there's, you know, money out there that could be put into things. And again, the, the tech interest for sure. Um, I think that this, uh, the, the business interest, I think, Andrew Longhurst's study certainly points to the uh, impact of uh, increasing privatization, uh, moving into this whole area of seniors care. And as Carrier and Peltier had noted earlier, here we are, a group of uh, generally better off, better educated people than uh, what were uh, in, in play during the time that they did their study. Um, we can, you know, we have perhaps a bit more disposable income that we can buy into these things. So we support it, they're there. Uh, governments see this as a way of um, avoiding costs uh, through taxation. And so that business uh, interest is certainly a very important one for us all to consider as we think about uh, aging in place. I want to just provide a couple of um, notes here just as we transition over to just get a sense of what the aging in place picture is here in Victoria. On the southern tip of Vancouver Island, when you look at um, current approximate uh, population, 65 and older, there are apparently 80, uh, approximately 88,000 people. Of those, it's really important to note only 4%. So out of 88,000 people, 65 and older, only 3,520 people are actually living in long-term care. 
And again, that's in the southern tip of Vancouver Island. Approximately 6%, so maybe about 5,300 people, live in public and private assisted living. And that means that 90% of seniors live independently. And I think that that's an important thing for us all to kind of keep in mind. When we look at that picture, thinking back to Carrier and Pelche's study, in 75, they said 8.2% of seniors were living in long-term care. Now here on the island, uh, we're in a situation where just 4%, half that number, are actually in long-term care. And it seems to me, no doubt, the introduction of assisted living has assisted in, in um, drawing off some of the people who Carrie and Pelche would have found in long-term care. There's now this intermediate category of assisted living that's probably taking up a good proportion of those. But I think that it's important to note that I think that there are a lot of seniors out there um, kind of holding things together but struggling with their living arrangements and it is my perspective and I'd, I'll be interested to see where uh, the audience is on this. I think much of that struggle uh, flows back to the fact that it is our home and community care supports that have not kept pace with the growing um, population of seniors and the growing demand for for social uh, and health services to foster people's ability to to live well and to remain in community. I think all of this is driven by what I see in all of this as this independence narrative. Independence is a, a really strong identity for seniors. And I think perhaps rather than thinking about independence as an actual state that we're either in or we're not in, we can think about independence more in a relational sense. And just a little bit of uh, bald uh, advertising here. I'm just uh, pointing uh, to a book that uh, with a colleague of mine, Chris Cici from the University of Alberta, uh, should be coming out a little bit later on this year, uh, following a study that we did, an ethnographic study, looking at how families manage uh, to engage in care at home when one of the family has a d diagnosis of dementia. And I just want to read you a little section, whoops, I'm just going to go back here for a minute, a little section from that book that just gives you a sense of what I'm trying to get at when I say that um, uh, in independence needs to be sort of thought of more as a relational concept. This is a little segment from the, from I think chapter five, and it's uh, a little segment on uh, a family we called the Cruz family. They had their own uh, positive and distinct way of paying due attention to matters that could be said to be about safety. When we took this little segment, uh, this family had just come out of a medical appointment and the doctor had advised the family that uh, David, who is the father, was uh, failing sufficiently that they now had to be very careful of his safety. Safety was everything and that they needed to be monitoring him 24 seven. He could not be left alone. Somebody had to be with him and watching him all the time. And this is a little family of mom and dad and two sons living in a home together, but everybody's busy. Um, mom's got a busy uh, community life. The boys are both working. And so the idea of needing to be 24 seven monitoring David was something that had kind of struck them as being, this is going to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, it could not be said that they are attached to discourses of risk management in the same way as professional practitioners. This family is made up of David and Catherine and their two adult sons, Brent and Josh, both of whom live in the family home with their parents. David has a complicated health history alongside memory problems that had increased over the past two years and a diagnosis of dementia six months prior to the first author's involvement, there was history of a Parkinson's type illness that had affected his mobility. David's Parkinson's like symptoms had made walking difficult and he had already experienced several falls related to foot drop. So along with concerns about altered cognition, David's falls were a problem that need to be, needed to be looked after. The excerpt that follows is from the field notes and it shows one way in which this was done, the practical handling of safety in the day-to-day -day life of the family. 
Though this description of going out for lunch offers only a glimpse of daily practices, it does show something of the family ethos, which Isabel Stengers would describe as the specific terms through which their needs, behaviors, habits, and crucial concerns positively diverge in producing the family practice. And because this is an ecological framing in meeting their specific environment. We put our coats on and start to walk down the street to the cafe. Josh has gone to get the car and move it closer to the cafe. David is pushing his walker and I become aware of just how uneven the sidewalk is as he seems to catch one of the sliders on every crack. It's about a half a block of slow walking to the intersection and then we cross, uh, we get to across the intersection. In, uh, the sidewalk is cut for accessibility, but is still a little slow for us to get across on the light. Inside the cafe, we find a table. David says loudly that he's hungry. Catherine and I help him get settled in a chair. Josh comes in and we discuss what to eat and what to get for David to eat. Catherine and I order a coffee and sit back down with David. In minutes, Josh is putting a plate of pasta in front of his dad. He also orders a sandwich for them to share. Then David says he has to go to the bathroom and Josh goes off to find the location. He comes back and gets his dad. Slowing down to observe, but still recognizing that the intricacies of daily practices are hard to put into words. We can see the people, objects and relations involved in the practice. We start to see what the family is paying due attention to. The family's practice clearly includes considerations of safety, but points to something else that is much more complex. The walk outside shows the materials and relations that are part of the family's arrangements. The car being moved, the walker being moved over the uneven pavement, David's slow and careful steps, and those walking with him matching their pace with his, the crosswalk timing, the restaurant tables, and the accessibility of the bathroom. The family as a collective that obviously includes David works to navigate the space in what seems a precarious way. The fit is not quite good between the sidewalk and the walker. The bathroom access has to be scoped out. Safety, we could say, emerges through these moment to moment embodied practices of navigating the logistics of the outing, accommodating the body and behavior of David, making up for the mismatch between the space and time of the world outside of their home and their ability to be in it. If a case manager were to visit this family, it would be noted that David lives independently. But does this picture that I've just painted about their practice of going out for coffee suggest independence? I think it is helpful, particularly in this context, to think about aging in place, to think about in independence not as a state, but rather as a relation. And here, as Fowler notes, that personhood is attained and maintained through relationships, not only with human beings and objects, places, animals, and spiritual features of the cosmos. As you think about aging in place, take time to critically reflect on how you live your life every day. What relations do you rely on in living your everyday life? Who's involved in, in you being able or not able to live the life that the way you dream of? These are just some of the things that I think we've, we've talked about here this evening, the notion of privatization, the influence of technology, the population dynamics, working conditions and pay of those who are working in this industry and it and it is truly that but I want to just leave you with a couple of questions things for you to think about within that sort of relational notion of of aging in place ask yourself how do we want how do you want to live your older years and how can you do so uh, what are the conditions that need to be put in place what are the conditions you can think about putting in place now perhaps working towards as time goes on to that support your wishes and with that, I'm just going to say thank you very much and uh, turn it back to John for some discussion. I'm sorry if I went over, I wasn't really able to pay attention to my timing. Um, should I, I stop? On? Yeah, should I stop sharing? Would that be helpful or? Um, I don't know. Anyway, Mary Ellen, can you hear me? I can. Oh, dear. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, good. 
Well, thank you very much for that presentation. It, it was a comprehensive look at what is a very significant and topical issue or set of issues. It's not just a single issue. Uh, it was, the presentation was, was uh, of a depth that was uh, rather astounding, what's going on with, with aging period and aging in place. And it was uh, completely accessible. So thank you very much for that. And, and also the, the statute provided certainly provides a very meaningful context. Good, good. I'm glad. So that thank you so much. You're very welcome. Now, before getting on, before getting on to the questions, I, I do have to apologize for my uh, rather squeaky feedback filled uh, introduction. I'm going to blame my iPad. <laughs> and also it was an example of rapid aging in place. Right. <laughs> And the influence oh. of technology. <laughs> yes, yes. And anyway, what happened was I, I'd left my iPad on with the Zoom uh -huh. presentation on that, and I had all the sound turned off, but it still kept coming through. So I don't know what happened. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to blame my iPad. Very good. It's not Very my good. Thank you. Okay. First question, and it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a rather broad question. Uh, it's, it's from a person uh, who immigrated to Canada uh, 50 years ago. And the question is, why the social cultural system of caring for parents in old senior aging Can Canada and USA is so different than what's found in Asian and African cultures, where joint family system parents are taken care of until they pass away, a social, moral, and more humane tradition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that this is often the case. Um, I think the North American um, cultural context, not one uh, hom homogeneous context by any means. I think, you know, within our, within our own communities, we have subgroups who manage uh, senior care in, in just that way. Um, you know, I think about, I'll just speak briefly about my own circumstance. You know, my mom and dad uh, lived in a um, townhouse with many stairs and as my mom aged and developed dementia, um, uh, I would come home after work. Uh, I had my own home, but I would come, I always come to my parents' home and help her with her evening meal and help her to get upstairs and, and um, within this, within the context of North America, where uh, for sure women's participation in the labor market has increased over the past 50 years. Um, you know, I guess what I'm unfamiliar with is what women's participation in the, in the um, labor market might be in the kind of circumstance that the questioner is asking about. Typically, these kinds of care uh, arrangements often fall to women. And, uh, you know, we have much literature that talks about the second and third shift that women often uh, end up uh, playing, where they're caring for family to get everybody off in the morning. They go to work, that's their second shift. And then they come home after work and they're caring again for family members. Um, it's often associated with burnout. Um, and I think it doesn't in the way that we've that we do it here in North America, it doesn't lead to long-term sustainable solutions for seniors. Um, a lot of families can't do without that second income, so it does place huge huge demands on families that um, often result in a senior perhaps needing to be placed into some kind of supportive housing because the family is just not able to manage that care at home. So yes quite possibly more humane, but I think it speaks about a set of uh, family and life arrangements that uh, are now quite historical for most Canadian families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now it seems, it seems like um, the individual has to initiate access to a fairly complex environment. Uh, for example, like how, how does one go about getting a caseworker? Is there any way to get help with the navigation? Um, not, not, no, I mean, I suppose in some ways that's kind of the role that 
I play now with my small group of, of senior women that I work with, um, making sure that they get hooked up with a case manager at the right time. Uh, anyone can, I mean, physicians should be able to make, access, make, uh, make those kinds of links for you as you age. Uh, but anyone in fact can call up uh, their local public health unit. There's one, you'll recognize it down at the bottom of the Cook Street Hill. It's serving, has been serving over the past year as a test site for COVID. Uh, but that big Sarah Spencer house there houses uh, a lot of public health nurses and, and community workers and uh, case managers work out of there. You can phone them up. You can ask to speak with a case manager and explain your circumstances. They'll come out, they'll do an assessment of the senior that you're concerned about and begin to uh, explore with you what some public options will be. They can often give you some, some uh, um, insights into private offerings as well, but typically they don't make recommendations about those because it's just not part of what they tend to do. Yeah. In your presentation, you mentioned BC has fallen to eighth place in terms of uh, aging in place or assisted living or seniors um, care, or yeah. whatever the term is. Uh, what, what provinces are best at assisted living care? Uh, Newfoundland is uh, tends to be on top. I think uh, many of the Atlantic provinces have been very uh, have been have had much better models. Perhaps because they're smaller. Uh, I don't know. Um, they've um, initiated a number of interesting uh, integrated care teams where they've got nurse practitioners working with general practitioners, general medical practitioners working with home care nurses and, and home support teams in a much more integrated fashion. I think what BC is initiating now in the form of these primary and urgent care clinics that are popping up all over the province, I think that the idea behind those is intended to try to model themselves after those integrated care teams. But to date, I, I have experienced them as being fairly medically orientated yet. So they are a, um, a group practice essentially for physicians, sometimes with nurse practitioners attached, but I don't think that they have yet evolved the model so that they've got that nice integration with home care nursing and home support teams. That kind of model did exist in this in this town uh, under the James Bay Health uh, Project for many years. Uh, if I can make a slight side remark, I'll just say that BHA has done everything in their power to shut that thing down. They tried to kill it many, many times. It just kept popping up because the community <laughs> really wanted those services, and they kept, you know, doing things to bring it back to life. Um, now there is a primary and, and urgent care clinic. But I think, uh, I really wish we could just learn some lessons from our own past um, and figure out how to do what the James Bay Community Project did for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, kind of following on that is uh, referring to home care in Victoria and um, Apparently you were, you were actively involved in 1998 when a review of services, Home is Where Our Health uh, oh, is, was conducted and a blueprint for neighborhood teams was proposed along with an evaluation plan. Right. You know uh, to what extent these services have been implemented? Uh, not, now that's really testing my memory. I have to say who's... <laughs> Some very wise person is asking that question, and I'm just trying to recreate it in my mind. Not that I'm aware of. I think what I'm still trying to bang the drum on is the development of kind of neighborhood neighborhood teams, mixed uh, professional and you know um, uh, semi-professional care partners all working together to provide care in the community that keeps people going in their own in their own homes or in you know wherever their preferred living situation is yeah I th well I th we haven't we haven't reached that goal yet yeah. well would this relate to uh, uh, neighbors sharing a caregiver 
anticipating the caregiver could be provided accommodations within the neighborhood? Yes, yes. Uh, now, uh, Island Health has started to offer a, a sort of uh, option like that at a place like, say, the Cridge uh, Senior Centre they have what they call cluster care. So because there's a number of seniors living in that circumstances, if they're deemed to be uh, requiring home support, they, uh, VHA has now placed home support workers in the Cridge Centre. And so that just means they can work out of a, a common room and go about helping seniors all over that senior centre, which works, I think, actually quite well. I think such a thing could be arranged. I think currently it has to be arranged in a private manner. I don't know of Island Health fostering any similar cluster-based care in the community itself. So, but I think a lot of people are beginning to explore that. And that's kind of what that, that village model um, seeks to do. So a number of people kind of getting together um, getting homes or apartments or whatever close together and then as a group hiring the kind of um, care providers that they want who would then just be sort of dedicated to them and would help support them in their senior years. Yeah uh, just a bit of a change. Uh, do occupational therapists in Canada work as case managers or is that an area that needs uh, collaboration with primary care physicians? Uh, no, I think uh, probably in some health units, uh, occupational therapists probably do uh, work in that role. It tends to be mostly the case manager, that actual formal role, tends to be either uh, nurses or social workers are the primary uh, professional groups that take up those, those roles as case managers. Uh, but I believe I recall in some places uh, occupational therapists and physiotherapists as part of that community-based team also serving in that role of a case manager. Mm -hmm. Well, here's uh, Barb Woodington has, has uh, oh, provided a a, an update here. Oh, housing uh, advocate extraordinaire. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, on Vancouver Island, there are five co-housing communities. Two are senior focused and three, including Ravens and Sydney, is multi-generational and intentional communities. So it Excellent. seems to be a growing phenomenon. It, it is. It's a very, um, it demands a lot of upfront work. And I commend folks like Barb who have uh, engaged in that work to, to work together as a group to figure out what are the rules of engagement going to be here? Uh, how are you going to manage, um, you know, conflicts that arise inevitably when you've got uh, people of, of uh, you know, different histories and so on gathering together and working in a neighborhood? I, I think um, th those who commit to really getting that work done up front as the housing, the co-housing uh, facility and arrangement of homes is being developed uh, are really to be commended. It's it's uh, it's not an easy um, option to take, but I think when it's done and done right and done for all the good reasons, and you've got a good group of people there, I think it it works fabulously well. Mm -hmm. Well, here's no. just a variation on that. What what about uh, three or four single people buying or renting a house together? and employing a healthcare uh, individual uh, collectively. Yep, yep. I think that would be um, sort of like that village model again. Um, uh, so you're maintaining uh, more the independent living as opposed to a sort of assisted living supportive arrangement where the staff are hired in by the, by the facility. This is just much more independent. Um, I have heard a lot of people talk about these things. I have not actually encountered one functioning in, in my going about, which is not to say that they're not happening. I just don't know about them. I do think like the co-housing model, you really need to you know, think it through in terms of, uh, are, is it gonna have long-term sustainability or is there gonna be in the end, you know, the last person standing? who's going to have to deal with the dissolution of the whole arrangement and perhaps move into 
you know, a long-term care facility or something. I, I just think it requires some thought about how does it, how does it begin? How do you function it through? And then where, where, where and how do you arrange for the ending of it? Yeah. Just as a final uh, comment, question, question, comment, and your reaction to it um, is uh, that BC's current services are are beyond lacking. <laughs> is the comment. Yeah. Uh, the business profits being made are extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, supports, housing, et cetera, are desperately needed. Yeah. Uh, and this individual supports aging in place with public support rather than private care. Yeah. What, what would your position be? Yeah, I was, it's interesting. I was uh, I had a, a brief interview this afternoon with uh, CBC All Points West, uh, the Drive Home Show, and the um, Catherine Marlowe asked me a similar kind of question. It kind of caught me off guard because I hadn't really given this too much thought, and I was uh, my response at that time was, you know, I really think uh, the provincial government ought to really focus on thinking through and developing a much more robust and reasonable number of long-term care beds. I, I, there's a part of me that feels like that's the best place for the province to be located in terms of building uh, settings for, for long-term care. And then uh, I added to that, I think we can be and could be thinking more um, systematically about what are the kinds of effective community-based supports that um, allow people to live and encourage people to continue to live in community, whether that's in their own home or an assisted living kind of facility. Um, you know, I think reading Andrew Longhurst's report, I am convinced he states quite boldly, we are a very rich province we can afford to do these things. And I think the pandemic has actually shown us that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, we can pull in massive amounts of resources to make that one facility policy operational. And now that it's been set up, my sincere hope is that in future years, governments won't back off of that because I think it's a very unsafe thing to be doing and it's a very, inequitous and unfair thing for uh, staff working in a private facility be, to be paid less to have these turnaround contracts so that they're not paid um, um, benefits and all the rest of it. They're, they're just giving very short-term contracts. The whole thing is very unfair and I think um, when you look at the what happened in Ontario and Quebec in the long-term care sector, their uh, reliance on private uh, facilities is much higher than ours is here currently, but there is a very strong lobby here in BC advocating for um, privatization in long-term care. Terry Lake sits over there in Kelowna and uh, he's, uh, he speaks on behalf of a very strong lobby uh, because people know there is a lot of money to be made as this as this questioner states and that is absolutely the case and I think it is a major public policy area that I would encourage all those uh, listening to try to avail yourselves of of information I certainly would recommend Andrew Longhurst's uh, uh, report as a very good place to start uh, he's a fascinating young man and has done some really good work on this and is clearly advocating for a uh, solely public, not-for-profit not for um, uh, system to be, to be built and supported. Yeah, uh, are, are there any available online resources to keep informed on these issues? Oh, uh, there are a number of uh, advocacy groups. There's one in particular that I'm I'm on their listserv, so I get all of their publications and, and their notes and so on. Uh, they're the uh, family, it's, it's not Family Caregivers Network, but they're a, a group of people concerned with um, resident and family uh, councils in long-term care. Um, 
in the lead up to the pandemic, they were already agitating to try to have more of a say from the family perspective on programming and, and care supports within long-term care. Um, they've been very active and they're very well linked provincially and nationally. I can add that, uh, a link to that group on, um, on my slides before they're posted uh, on the website. That would be, that would be one. Um, there's many, many. Um, I'll try and look up a few, John, and, and add, add some links to the slides. Okay. Well, that, that'd be a wonderful resource because I, I think you've stirred a lot of interest this evening. Okay. And I wanna thank you once again, not only for the presentation, but for your thoughtful <laughs> and uh, very informative responses. Great. So thank, thank you. you. And this, this uh, just as an aside, I'd like to thank uh, the over 100 individuals who tuned in tonight wow. and also remind them that the presentation and the slides will be available on the websites of either the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health or the UVic Retirees Association. And okay. I'm sure it will be visited more than many times. Okay. So once again, Mary Ellen, thank you. Thank this you. is a wonderful way to conclude this year's Masterminds series. Great. Thanks very much, John. And thank you very much, Sally, uh, for your wonderful introduction. And thanks uh, ever so much to Leah and Ali for all your uh, support and, and getting me linked in so that I could do this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Stay well and safe. <laughs>